Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. And my guest is Roland Warren of CareNet. And as you can tell, he's with us by the um, wonderful uh, capabilities of technology. And where exactly are you located, Roland? Uh, We're in uh, Lansdowne, Virginia. Okay, so for people who don't necessarily know where Lansdowne is, where where is that in Virginia? Uh, it's right outside. It's it's a bedroom community, I suppose, to to uh, Leesburg, Virginia, which probably doesn't help people much at all, <laughs> unless they're Civil War buffs. That's right. But yeah. uh, we're we're very close to Dulles Airport. Okay, uh, in in Washington D.C. area. Very yeah. good. And you are CEO of CareNet, and describe what CareNet is. Yeah, CareNet is a. Uh, network of 1,100 plus uh, pregnancy centers in the U.S. and Canada that uh, are really focused on offering a compassionate alternative uh, to abortion. So really our our vision is uh, we envision a culture where women and men faced with pregnancy decisions are transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and empowered to choose life uh, for their uh, unborn children and abundant life for their families. So it's really this kind of holistic perspective, but this network of pregnancy centers and local communities that affiliate with us at the national office in order to kind of move forward in, in a what I call a pro-abundant life uh, perspective. Okay, great. And how in the world did you get involved in something like this? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that. I always tell people, uh, and some people are old enough to remember, there used to be these old commercials uh, for this uh, for the hair club for men. I don't know if you remember that or not. Yeah, I, I, I'm of limited capabilities in that regard. So, <laughs> There's this, this guy who uh, was president of this company called the Hair Club for Men, and it was about trying to get men hair. And uh, at the end of the commercial, he would always hold up a picture of himself bald, and then, and then, obviously, in the commercial, he had a head, a wonderful head full of hair, and he would always say, "I'm not only the president, I'm a client." That kind of a thing. So I always use it as a joke because it's a great lead-in uh, to how I got involved uh, around the issue. Uh, when I was uh, a uh, 20-year-old uh, uh, college student, I got my girlfriend pregnant, and uh, we were uh, uh, encouraged to abort. Uh, we instead got married, which was our plan, and. Um, been married for 30, 36 years, so I really was sort of confronted with the whole notion of an unplanned pregnancy uh, and becoming a father in, in in that context. And so that really kind of set me down this path where the life issue was something that was uh, uh, something I had to consider at a very, very uh, um, early age in a, in, a, in a relative sense, and I'm thankful that we made the decision that we did. So over time, God just kind of led me down the path uh, to uh, to care now. Hmm. So, uh, so this is not just a theoretical exercise for you by any means. This is something you've actually lived through the decision-making process and everything else associated with it. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And and it's really shaped a lot of my thinking about about the issue. Certainly on the fatherhood front. Prior to coming to Canada, I was president of an organization called National Fatherhood Initiative for about twelve years, which was focused on connecting uh, the hearts of fathers to kids. And it really gave me an insight on the fatherhood issue and how fatherhood is connected to the life issue. And that's actually how I got connected into CareNet initially, uh, because I came to uh, uh, CareNet, uh, my predecessor's predecessor, and really ha- wanted to have a conversation about what were they doing to engage fathers uh, in, in, the, in the process when you had unplanned pregnancies, especially given that I knew uh, what role my, my role played in, 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 in the decision. So clearly, uh, legally, her body and her choice, uh, but I still have a responsibility. And the decision that a guy makes impacts greatly the choice that she makes, and I knew that firsthand as a, as a 20-year-old. So tell us a little bit about how CareNet works. You said you work with pregnancy centers. How did, I mean, are you, are you just there and people walk in, or is there anything um, uh, intentional and initiative about how you all go about having people come to the clinics? Okay. Well, Karen, I'm in the national office, so we're okay. an affiliate organization, an umbrella organization okay. that provides cover, training, technical assistance, marketing support, uh, all kinds of resources to help the network of pregnancy centers, which are their own 501c3s, do the work that they do. So the clients don't come here. Okay. Although we've had before, uh, but they go to the, the local pregnancy centers, uh, and the pregnancy centers are there to offer them compassion, hope, and help. 
uh, to help them uh, make a pregnancy decision. And, and, and certainly what our objective is and our goal is to help them uh, to make a decision f- to bring their child into the world. Okay. So so I take it these pregnancy centers are, are they independent pregnancy centers or are some of them affiliated with another organization and you just help them and give them additional support? How does that work? Yeah, they're, they're independent 501c3 organizations which were started up in, in communities. And it, really, the whole pregnancy center movement started uh, pretty early on when Roe v. Wade was decided, and abortions clinics started showing up in, in communities. And as Christians were apt to do, you know, we're in the business of really trying to offer compassion, hope, and help and rescue the vulnerable. And so what happened was organiz- um, local organizations said, gosh, we need to do something. We need to give an alternative to an abortion and offer the, some care there. And so pregnancy centers started that way, really grassroots, uh, started in communities. A big part of a pregnancy center work, work is church support. And, and, and that really started, you know, CareNet started in 1975, shortly after uh, Roe v. Wade, and really it was pregnancy centers that had started in that time frame coming to CareNet, which was called Christian Action Council at the time, and was focused more on sort of advocacy work, uh, more similar to things that like maybe the National Right to Life uh, does, for example, but more from a, uh, from a Protestant perspective, because National Right to Life had more of a Catholic leaning. So this was, uh, CareNet came from a Protestant perspective. It was started by uh, Francis Schaefer, C. Everett Coop. And a, and a theologian named Harold O.J. Brown and also Billy Graham was involved, and really to mobilize uh, the Protestant community uh, and evangelicals uh, specifically around the life issue. So we started there, started offering this support, and over time said, you know what, there's so much need to plant pregnancy centers across the country that CareNet kind of moved away from uh, CareNet, which was a project actually of Christian Action Council, sort of said, you know, we're not going to focus on the ag- advocacy part of, of, of the work, we're going to focus on the care side of the issue, and then started providing that support. So that's what we do. Okay, so there probably are probably then two levels of our conversation, and that is helping people understand pregnancy centers and how they work and that kind of thing and the kind of work that they do, the kind of support that they give, and then how CareNet stands um, above them or around surrounds them with with support. So let's go in yeah. that let's go in that order. Let's let's talk about the pregnancy centers. We've we've had some discussions with Brian Fisher, who works with a set of pregnancy centers around the country that provide a whole array of support and actually, in some cases, initiate contact with prospective people coming into the pregnancy center in the hopes of of, uh, having them have a conversation in which they can encourage them to bring the child to term as opposed to aborting. Um, uh, So... I, I take it, given that you're an umbrella organization, you've got pregnancy centers that kind of have all kinds of capabilities in terms of being very simple to very more, much more complex um, centers that, that offer this kind of service. Am I right about that? Yeah, no, ab- absolutely, absolutely right. In, in fact, uh, um, you know, when, when, uh, when Brian's organization actually got started initially, CareNet was one of the uh, organizations that kind of they came to for assistance because we have 1,100 pregnancy centers, and uh, uh, I think there are a few centers that they now own, but the majority of the centers that are kind of connected in are actually affiliates to affiliates of Care- CareNet. So. Mm-hmm. That's a big part of kind of what we, uh, big part of what we do is, is providing that level of that level of of support for folks that are there. Some of the centers, the vast majority of them, about seventy percent of the centers are medical. In other words, they have some type of medical service, whether whether they're doing ultrasound or uh, STI testing or something like that. All of them, uh, the other ones that aren't doing that, are really offering more of a, on the care side, uh, offering material support in some way, shape, or form. In terms of what, in terms of what they, in terms of what they do, but you know, the, the frankly, the, the the biggest thing that that pregnancy centers really can do is really kind of elevate the conversation around around the issue. You know, I I think wholeheartedly, um, you know, that that the goal of the pro life movement uh, it may sound a little interesting to say, but the goal of the pro life movement is not is not just ending abortion. Um, I think that that's a, a strategy or a tactic, but I think the goal of the pro-life movement should really be making sure that children not just have life, but have abundant life. Um, so it, it's not just about saving a baby, it's about raising a child. You just don't want that person to come in who's dealing fatherhood, motherhood, sex, and marriage, uh, and then ended up in a, in, with a pregnancy decision to leave with those things delinked and not consistent with God's design, because guess what will happen? They'll leave and then they'll come back later 
uh, with a new crisis and a new baby. So our, our we have to, we try to really make sure that our model is not um, is not retail. Our sign shouldn't say thank you, come again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Burger King, or frankly, like Planned Parenthood, our sign should say thank you. Don't come again, not to be served but to be service to others. So it's really modeling what Christ did with the woman at the well. So I always tell people the woman at the well yesterday is the woman at the at the pregnancy center today. Disconnected from community, all alone, at risk. And the turning point uh, in that whole discussion with Christ was when he told her to call her husband. So her issue of being there uh, at risk was really tied to her no husband problem. And if you think about it in the context of the work that we do, the reason why folks are at the pregnancy center also is tied to the no husband problem, given that 86% of the women that have abortions are unmarried. So what we try to do is just have a holistic approach, not just about saving the baby, about raising the child, and, and really kind of structuring our work that way. So if uh, it sounds like your work's a lot like what we've talked to Brian about, which is not only uh, having a conversation about bringing the child to term, but actually surrounding the woman with a whole array of support that allows them to feel, I'm not going through this alone. I have people who are going to walk alongside me in the midst of it, who are going to be there for me uh, in the midst of it, and, and also establish relationships and hopefully connections and networks that will be there for me after I have the child. Yeah, but I think it, it, true. But I think it's it, it's different in a sense in terms of in terms of the narrative uh -huh. that that we try to articulate. I mean, the sort of the, the the story that God gave me. I call it the nativity story that God gave me that really frames our work and a real focus for our work is really this notion about family and the role of family. So if if you look at you know if you if you look at the whole story of the birth of Christ, right, which. Christ was an unplanned pregnancy from a human perspective, right? Yeah, <laughs> so right. Mary, right? She, she saw the similar kind planned of Planned at one level and unplanned at another. <laughs> yeah. Mary was feeling at that moment, I'm sure it's the same kind of thing that my wife was feeling, mm -hmm. same any woman walking into a pregnancy. What, how am I going to tell my community? Uh, how am I going to support my All these things. And what did she do? Right? She, she chose life. In other words, she said, let it be unto me as you have said. Mm -hmm. But what did God do to make sure that Mary's unplanned pregnancy wasn't a crisis pregnancy? He sent an angel to Joseph, who in many ways was much like an abortion-minded man, hopes and dreams for his life, was life with Mary, that didn't include a child at this time and in this way. And the angel was very specific in terms of what he said to Joseph. The first thing that he said was, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Not your baby mama, not your boo, not some other thing, but your wife. Mm -hmm. And so really, the key there, and that what you see here, this is a real big difference in terms of what Karen is doing, is that we're not just focused on the sanctity of life. We're focused also on the sanctity of marriage and family consistent with God's design. That's what you see in that, in that story in the first chapter of the first book of the New Testament. The angel first affirms the sanctity of life, a sanctity, excuse me, of marriage and family consistent with God's design, and then the sanctity of life. And I believe in many ways in terms of what how we've been focused over the years is really focusing on the sanctity of life issue without focusing on the sanctity of marriage and family issue. And as a result, again, as I said to you early on, 86% of the women that have abortions are unmarried. Right. So it's not just about wrapping her around her a bunch of support. It's really about um, going and making sure that you're doing everything that you can to engage that father into that process so that she doesn't become a repeat client. So that there, what's modeled there is God's design. And I think, uh, frankly, a, a lot of times in terms of this work, we have not done that. We haven't done that particular piece. And it, and it can devolve into more of a social services piece. And it, frankly, can devolve into a situation where you're seeing repeat clients. So if it's just saving the baby, if she comes back with a new baby and then you save that baby, I mean, is that really what God wants us to do? You know, as one who grew up in a single mother home, I can tell you firsthand how difficult it is for mothers and children. Is that really God's best? Is that really God's design? You see? So really, uh, the narrative that we're talking about is the difference between being pro-life and being pro-abundant life, mm -hmm. which, which means that if you look at what does abundant life look like to a baby, you can go back to the narrative of what happened with Christ. You know, a father and mother united in marriage, loving each other, loving their child and loving God. It's the high idea that you saw with the, the narrative of Christ. And that's really what we focus on as well, that perspective, not just being pro-life, 
but being pro-abundant life, which means that you're going to focus very aggressively on building strong families so that co- clients are not repeat clients. And then we don't just celebrate when, when a baby is saved, but we're focused on also trying to talk about marriage and those kinds of things. And that's a, a real big difference between what CareNet is doing in terms of the work that, that we try to do on a daily basis. That's the first part of the big difference. Okay, so that's clear. So so you're, so you're that means that you're there's really an effort not just to engage the prospective mother, but actually the boyfriend or whatever who who is with her and try and encourage them to become a couple, become a family, that kind of thing? Absolutely. And and and, 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 and it's interesting because we actually call our, the fatherhood work that we do at CareNet the Joseph Project. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because what we're trying to do is essentially the work is about trying to encourage the woman to tap into her inner Mary, to ascribe to himself, herself the virtue and the character of Mary. Well, we should be trying to do the same thing with the guy, trying to encourage him to ascribe to himself the virtue and the character of Joseph. And and, and that's why I made the point about, you know, that that what did God what did God do? He went for Joseph. See, Jesus could have come into the world via a single mother that would have accomplished God's purpose. But it would have violated a principle, a high idea, a design that he has. And so that's why linking together the sanctity of, of marriage and family and the sanctity of life is critical. You'll never hear anyone here talking about the sanctity of life without talking about the sanctity of marriage and family, because those two things are linked. And again, as I said, 86% of the women that have abortions are unmarried. We did a national survey with LifeWay, uh, which folks could get if they come to our website, and we asked women who had had abortions. Who was the most influential in your decision to abort? And guess who was number one? The father. Far way ahead of mother, girlfriend, best friend, uh, the father was number one. But if you look at how the movement's been framed for nearly 40 years, it's been focused either on saving the baby or the woman and the baby, but it has not been focused on, it has not been focused on this notion around forming families and God's design for families and that high idea that's there. And that and that's part of it. Okay. So the next question obviously is you bring in the fa- the father into the equation, you're encouraging them to become a family. And I take it that because there are issues oftentimes that need to be dealt with, that you've yeah. got to surround both both the father and the mother with support. What does that look like? Well, and that's a good point. And I, and I also want to stress this point, too, because so folks don't get it twisted, as, as, we, as we used to say back in my day, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's not just about whether she marries that guy, because that's not possible all the time, and frankly, not even necessarily the right thing all the time. But mm-hmm. it's about reconnecting God's design, fatherhood, motherhood, sex, and marriage, relinking those things in their mind so that their mind is transformed, so that the next time that they have an opportunity to have a sexual encounter, they're looking at through the, that through the lens of God's design. I mean, that's why a, a, a husband will be faithful to his wife, right? He, he's got an opportunity to maybe have a sexual encounter, but he says, you know what, no, no, I, I believe motherhood, fatherhood, sex, and marriage consistent with God's design, I reject that because having sex in that context would violate that. So even if they, the couple does not form, it's about transforming the mind so that you don't see her as a repeat as a repeat client. And so that's a big part of the, the, the support mechanism, this transforming the mind, not just celebrating, saving the baby, but really focusing on transforming the mind so that you don't see a repeat client. Now, in terms of the support piece, you're absolutely right. And it really leads to the second thing that's really significant about Karenette's model. That first pillar that I talked about is really the sanctity of marriage and family, which is kind of anchored in the first chapter, the first book of the New Testament. There's a second pillar, which is this whole focus on discipleship, which is in the last chapter of the first book of the New Testament, mm-hmm. that we're, we're called to make disciples. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, pregnancy centers do in, in CareNet's network, we're very focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the pregnancy centers can do evangelism, which leads to conversion, but they can't do discipleship, which leads to replication. And so a big key part of what we are also doing, particularly through our Making Life, Deni- Dis- Making Life Disciples initiative, is equipping churches to have pregnancy care ministries in the church so that clients can move from pregnancy centers to the church for ongoing support and discipleship. That is a key and significant difference in terms of what we're doing and and much needed because if we don't do that, then she's much more likely to go and become a a disciple of the culture Mm -hmm. and then replicate and come back with a a new baby. So it's really linking the the life issue 
uh, to the discipleship issue and, and Making Life Disciples, which is a ministry kit that uh, Caridad has that we're uh, encouraging churches and, and folks within church to basically use their small groups so that those small groups can come alongside those clients who are facing pregnancy decisions and walk alongside them in terms of providing the support that they need. So that means probably something more than simply saying, oh, well, there's this church down the street that I recommend to you, and you should attend, et cetera. There's something far more intentional involved. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I tell people all the time is that when you look at Jesus' model, he had both a retrieving and a receiving model, right? Some folks he retrieved, like the disciples, like, hey, you, drop your nets. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. You up the tree, come down. We're going to have a power lunch, right? Mm -hmm. But then there are others that he received, like the woman with the issue of blood, right? So we have to have both a retrieving and a receiving ministry in terms of what we're doing around the life issue. And you see that very clearly with Peter. When Jesus asked Peter, when Peter said, hey, I want to come out the boat in the storm to you, Jesus received him, said, come on. <laughs> the water's fine. But when Peter started to have trouble, Jesus didn't just keep saying, well, just keep coming. Right? <laughs> he went out and he retrieved him. Well, that's the part, in my view, that's been missing in terms of this whole life issue. The church... If we're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus and model what Jesus did, the church has to be both in a retrieving and receiving role, which means the church has to be receiving clients from the pregnancy center so that they can be transformed to make to become disciples of Jesus Christ. And what you do when you do that, say, you, you know, if you view the issue through the lens of just material support, see, then, then you're, in my view, you're not really viewing it from, from a Christian narrative fully. You really should be viewing it as a discipleship issue. If you believe that helping someone who's facing a pregnancy decision is good work, all good work that Christians do should equal discipleship, right? Everything that we do, water for the thirsty, food for the hungry, clothes for the naked, well, compassion for the pregnant should be viewed. So you should look at, when you see someone facing an unplanned pregnancy from a, pregnancy from a Christian perspective, if you just say, well, gosh, what kind of support does she need and diapers and this and the other, again, my view is that you're, you're aiming too low. You're not rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar, unto God what is God's. The first thing you should say in your head is, she needs to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. The child growing inside of her needs to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The guy who got her pregnant needs to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you can't do discipleship without doing material support in the same way that you know, Christ said, look, if you see your brother or sister in need and say, be well and be fed, what? The love of God is not in you. So by focusing on discipleship, you get material support, Right? and the transformation that comes with becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. But if you only focus on material support, just kind of surrounding them with support, so to speak, without the discipleship message, then you may not get the discipleship piece. So that's the piece that does that. That's what motivates that. And that's what Making Life Disciples, which is a research we developed to equip the church, uh, church small groups to offer compassion, hope, and help, is really significant in terms of CareNet's model of not just, not just making sure that helping women and men that are faced with pregnancy decisions survive, but also make them thrive and become disciples of Jesus Christ, which is really the call that we have as Christians. Let's let's talk about what I would guess is the common situation. A woman walks in to one of the pregnancy centers. She says, I'm pregnant. Uh, what am I going to do? I'm assuming that she, she may walk into your center not knowing whether she's going to keep the baby or not, and, and it starts from there. Walk us through kind of how, how your centers handle that kind of situation. Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting question, and there's lots of different ways that clients come to us. Uh, one way, obviously, is they find us on, on, on the web. With, we use a, a very effective in terms of doing keyword advertising. Uh, women will type in, you know, um, uh, abortion or abortion pill or I'm pregnant, I don't know, whatever that it may be, and they'll find a pregnancy center and call and, and want to come in. And, and one of the things that we do is we really invite her to come in and tell her that we, there's support that we know that we can provide for her. But a key piece also as well is that we invite her to bring the father of the child with, with mm. him. And, and it's key because it, it's not, it, you know, it's the difference between saying, you know, uh, is, is the father uh, going to come with you? is one way, but that doesn't isn't the most effective. The most effective says we would like him to come with you. And one of the reasons that's so important is kind of what I was saying before, that we know that he's the most influential in her decision her decision to uh, to keep the child or not. If she can see herself having his support, it's a key uh, a, a driver for us. So when you invite the, the client in, the client comes in, there's an intake process where you just basically do a needs assessment to try to understand, you know, what what is causing them to get to where they where they where they get they are. 
and, and what are the issues that they are facing. Essentially, one of the things I say often is that life decisions need life support. Um, so you, you know those like those life rings that you see that they have at swimming pools and you have on boats. That's what I mean. Life decisions need life support. So in a sense, she's kind of out there in the water and you've got the speedboat and you're getting to her and you're throwing those life supports. Now, what are those life supports? Well, those are the reasons why she wants to have an abortion. Right. And, and one of the things that I always focus on is that, you know, the decision to have an abortion is really a from, from conception to birth kind of decision. But that's not what's driving the decision. What's actually driving the decision is what happens after birth. So right. it's really nine seconds, nine months and one second. Mm -hmm. So to the degree that she can't see that she has support after after birth, um, she's much more likely to have the uh, abortion. So what you want to be doing is is kind of talking to her about the support mechanism that she has to help her understand that while you're trying to help her understand fully the life growing inside of her. Now, one of the things that's key, and, and, and particularly in our culture today, given ultrasounds and things of that nature, is really trying to uh, encourage uh, her and him to have an ultrasound. Um, and, you know, as an African-American, you know, one of the analogies I use often is, you know, those cameras that went into Mississippi in the 60s. It, and it really brought the civil rights movement right into their homes. They saw the what was happening to the vulnerable at that time. Well, the ultrasound is the window into the womb in the same way that that camera was the window into the civil rights movement. And she starts to see the life that's inside of her. And particularly for the guy, that's really important because, as you know, we are very visual. Mm -hmm. Like our bodies don't change when a pregnancy happens, hurts us. And when the guy's there, what we find is he, that he's much more likely to be supportive of bringing the child into the world. And she does as well when she hears the heartbeat and, she, and, and it becomes real for her in a, in a very tangible way. And then after that, now you've, now you've got that, but that's not the end of the story because these situations tend to ebb and flow based on the support mechanism and you really want to be walking alongside them during that during that process and the needs a second now about how many i mean you say you uh, urge them to bring in the father what what kind of percentages do you get out of that request do you, do you know yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, we have we still have way more female clients than, than male clients. You know, roughly it, it roughly is I guess probably closer to maybe thirty percent or so will come in with 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 the guy, uh, and that's been growing over the years. Candidly, we used to not even ask hmm. because the issue was framed as a you know this is about the woman and the child, and for various different reasons we weren't engaging the guy. There wasn't we weren't even 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 designed to equip the guy. And that was one of the things I started when I was with National Fatherhood Initiative and how I got connected to CareNet in the beginning. We started a project and a funder that wanted to, to fund putting fatherhood resources into pregnancy centers to see what we could do to help engage him. And, and that was very personal for me because I grew up without my father um, and I understood the temptation that a guy will have to run if he doesn't know what it means to be a dad, he's never had a dad, the prospect of being a dad can be terrifying and it's just easier to run. So having resources there and also having what you're seeing increasingly is is uh, client advocates who have specialized on working with the guy. So when she comes in, there are folks working with her, walking through the issue from her perspective as a woman, but then there, there's someone there to walk through this issue with, with the guy to help him start to have that perspective. Because often you'll hear a guy say, I don't want to be a father, I don't want to be a father. And one of the things that a guy can say to another guy very firmly is, you already are a father. The question is, what kind of father are you going to be? Are you going to be the kind of father that protects the vulnerable and helps bring your child into the world? Or are you going to be the kind of father who helps in the life of your child? Fatherhood begins at conception, <laughs> right? And so really being able to say that directly to men, and it really snaps and helps them really understand fully uh, the role that they play. And then also, one of the first resources that we developed when I came to CareNet was before she decides. For years, we had a resource called Before You Decide, which was focused on the woman and helping her understand what was going on inside of her and the issues. But there was never a corresponding uh, resource for the guy. So we were maybe trying to engage him after she made the decision, if you will. But we need to get him involved early in the process before she decides so that you can be involved. You have agency there. And we know, given what we know about the research and the data and just common sense, he can have a tremendous impact on the decision that she makes. So our model is really geared towards uh, leading towards that. So you got three scenarios, the best I can tell. You got the woman coming in on her own. 
There's yep. no there's no guy in the equation that you're able to get access to. Right. You've got a woman coming in with a guy, and you sit there, and and the question becomes, is this, is this a workable couple, if I can say it that way? And then you've right. got a girl who comes in with a guy, and you go, yeah, this is a workable couple. This is something that can that will work. Um, take us through each of those scenarios a little bit, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you and and when you have a situation, and unfortunately, too many of our women coming in by themselves. One of the things that we still want to make sure that we do is that we try to help her get connected to the dad in any way, shape, or form that we can, because we know that long-term support is really going to be really going to be critical. And candidly, that's one of the reasons why church involvement is so critical during that phase from conception to birth. Hmm. Um, because you know it, it's interesting. One of the scriptures God gave me when I first started do, doing this work was James 1, 20, 27. Talks about religion as pure and faultless in God's sight, to, but to care for the orphans and widows in their distress. And the insight I had was when that was written, what was an orphan and what was a widow? Well, an orphan was a child without a father, and a widow was typically a mother without a husband. And so what we have in our pregnancy centers are cultural orphans and widows. And the church has a very, very specific call to orphans and widows, which means the support that that single mom's going to need makes a life decision. Her knowing that early on in that process from conception to birth is critical to her making the life decision, which is why the church needs to be in the retrieving ministry as well. So that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that that she's got that support um, within the church and, and trying to do our best to connect her to the church so that she's what's modeled for her even if she never has a husband or a father, a husband for herself or a father for the child, you see that modeled in the church so that she can, so that her child can aspire to have that from that perspective. So we want to really do that and model that. When it's a couple that's coming in together, again, church support and that involvement is important. Why? Because that couple needs someone to help them understand what a good marriage looks like. If they come from a community where they've been to more baby showers than wedding showers, how are they supposed to do that? Well, we've got folks in the church that have been married for decades. Could you walk alongside a couple who's facing a pregnancy decision and help them see what a healthy, godly marriage looks like and, 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 and link with them? So all of this stuff, in my view, all roads lead to church involvement around this, this issue. And one of the things I say all the time is that, look, you know, our churches, we have these small groups in churches, right? And most small groups are about us loving us. Right, we, it's us loving us. Somebody new tries to come to our small group. Sometimes we're like, "Hey, you want to mess up our feng shui? You got something going on here, right?" What if our small groups were about us loving them? What if, as a small group, we got trained with a resource like Making Life Disciple, and we went to the pregnancy center network and said, "Listen, when you have a client, we want to walk alongside that woman, or we want to walk alongside that couple, so that we can help them with the reasons why they want to have an abortion. Maybe they don't have a place to live. You got somebody in your small group got an extra room." Maybe he doesn't have a job. You got a small business. Will you hire him? Maybe she can't get to her prenatal visits. You're retired. Can you take her? Yeah, all these. This is what the church, and this has been kind of one of my big things. We've allowed the abortion, uh, legalization of abortion, to actually change how we as Christians respond to the abortion issue. I mean, to unplanned pregnancies. Too often we try to outsource it to pregnancy centers or someone else. What do we used to do before abortion was legalized? Right. So if a couple got married, what do we do? I mean, got pregnant, what do we do? Well, we try to come alongside the couple where possible. We try to encourage marriage. We try to integrate them. In all this. Well, I'm saying that's what we should be doing now, mm -hmm. especially as we're praying for and marching for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. We should be acting like it's overturned, and the church needs to be a big response there. So a key part of that, the pregnancy center can only walk alongside that client from conception to birth and maybe a little bit further. But after that, if you come into a pregnancy center with a 10-year-old, ain't much we can do for you. Mm -hmm. That's why the church piece is a key part of our pro-abundant life model, those two pillars that hold up this roof that say pro-abundant life based on John 10.10. 10. The two pillars are the family and us modeling that and, and talking about that and helping to support that to the best of our ability, both physically and in, in intellectually. But then also the second pillar is really this notion around discipleship, which is the two pieces coming together. Okay, so um, going back to our three scenarios for just a second, the the when you have a couple that comes in and, and it really doesn't look like there's a way to put the couple together, then the situation becomes more like what you have when you have the woman by herself. And right. I, I, I guess that becomes the default, but you know, just by the nature of things. Whereas when you have the couple that 
that looks like you know they're gonna they're gonna go for it together and they're gonna try and make make it work. Uh, then what you need is the community support to help them uh, make it happen, if you will, and to reinforce that decision. Is that are those kind of the generic yeah, I, scenarios that you've got going? Yeah, I, I just edit that in one way. Even in a situation where the couple is not going to be able to be a couple together, we still want to encourage co-parenting. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I spent much time on, obviously, with National Fatherhood Initiative, is talking about the, the well-being of children. And what we know is that when kids have involved, responsible, and committed fathers, they're much less likely to use drugs, become teen parents, be poor, all these different things. So even if the guy is not going to be married to the mother, which we know based on research shows, uh, when kids are raised by their married biological parents, they do better across every psychological, social, social educational, and economic measurement of child well-being. And when that's not possible, we still want father involvement in, in the child's life. And so we still have an opportunity there to say, look, maybe you as a couple don't work for whatever the reasons may be, but we still need to work with him to help him be the best dad that he can be in a co-parenting context in the same way. And, and that means that we need to help her understand how important his involvement is in that child's life, even if they're not married. Um, because that, that's critical uh, to the support for that child. And to me, as a, as a kid who grew up without a dad, I can tell you firsthand what it feels like not to have a father who is connected with your heart to heart and, and the impact that that can have on, on your life. So in any one of those scenarios, there's still we still want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can in that regard. And the other reason why you want to keep him engaged is, frankly, the next time he has an opportunity to have sex, we want him to have fatherhood, motherhood, sex, and marriage linked in his mind so that he's not producing repeat clients for us. <laughs> and we do want him. You want him unemployed. <laughs> yeah. We don't want him out there. Yeah. We don't want him out there producing more children right. to become clients, uh, clients for the pregnancy center. So in all three of those scenarios, there really is a role uh, for us in terms of that. Uh, that transformation that needs to happen. Okay, there's one more scenario that's in my head before we move on and talk about the other initiatives that you all uh, supply, yeah. and it is, okay, so you've got a mother who comes in, she has a father, they don't work as a couple, she has the child, but then she gets married to somebody else, so now you've got a two-father situation, at least in, in one sense of the term. Um, do you all deal with that very often? Does that happen on occasion? Just yeah, that's kind of more downstream after, you know, that's for pregnancy center specifically, that's more down, more downstream. But the churches will face that situation. Absolutely. It, it is the step parenting, co-parenting dynamic, which churches, you know, are increasingly becoming more adept in terms of dealing with. The scenario that we didn't talk about that's more likely is the, the opportunity for adoption. Okay. Um, and that's the one that we're, where there's opportunities there. And again, having the father involved and supportive of that process where they as a couple don't feel that they can marry or raise this child. We want to make sure that she understands that adoption is a life affirming option uh, for her. And that's one of the other things that we talk about. We talk about single parenting, married parenting, uh, adoption uh, as well, and, and then co-parenting are the, the kind of the four scenarios that we that we talk to. And those are the things that we deal with more so uh, than kind of stuff that's downstream uh, after after conception and, and birth. Okay, now you, you mentioned to me that there are kind of two other initiatives that CareNet is involved in that we haven't talked about so much. Why don't we go through those? And you can take them in whatever order you want. Sure, yeah, sure. One of the other initiatives that we started in 2012 was something called the Pregnancy Decision Line. And the Pregnancy Decision Line is basically a, a, a call center, if you will, that we have here at CareNet where um, folks find us online uh, through keyword advertising and they'll call our number, uh, the pregnancy decision line number, and uh, they, they are facing a pregnancy decision. And the objective of the pregnancy decision line is to coach them to a life decision. So these are long calls with someone. You can think about like almost like a suicide hotline type thing uh, in terms of in terms of the framework. And we get calls from women and from men. About about 80% uh, are women and about 20% are, are men with someone who's facing a pregnancy decision. Often they're looking for an abortion. Our first thing we say is, look, we can either provide or refer for abortion, but we think we can help you. And then we talk them through that perspective. And it really is about helping that client who may never darken the door of a pregnancy center um, be able to 
make a life decision. So that's a key, key initiative. Uh, if it's necessary, then we will refer them to a pregnancy center and we'll do a, a warm handoff. So we'll have them on the phone and we'll connect them to a pregnancy center uh, when, when possible so they can come into a pregnancy center for uh, additional support. And then the other, the last piece that we, uh, the last initiative is the church initiative, which again, you know, is this notion of, you know, if you think about what, what it takes to transform the abortion issue, there's two things that I think have been missing in the model. One is, one is a long-term family and relationship support, and the other is long-term discipleship. Those are the two transform transforming things uh, that really hadn't, uh, that had been missing. Pregnancy centers, again, can't do the long-term support, and our pregnancy decision line can't do that either, but the church can. And so that's why the church is one of our three, we call them wells of compassion uh, that, that we have. One is the pregnancy decision line for clients who may never uh, want to darken the door, at least initially, and then we can refer them to pregnancy centers. And then once they're at a pregnancy center and getting the support that they need there, we want to transition those people into the church uh, so that they can be disciples of Jesus Christ and have long-term uh, uh, discipleship support along with long-term relationship and family and marriage support. So um, I imagine you have these statistics. I'm almost afraid to ask the question. Uh, when someone calls the pregnancy line, what kind of uh, what kind of percentage do you get of people who who, if I can say it this way, change their mind about why they've called? Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, our target our target is really seven to ten percent. Hmm. Uh, it's incredibly it's incredibly difficult. Uh, as you can imagine, with 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 those calls, and which is a very very good number, it's you know it's like catching a fastball with no mitt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. The calls are coming in, and if you think about that, it's pretty amazing. It's it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's like if you go into some place and 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 you're looking for a certain thing, and they say, I don't sell that thing, I don't have that thing, nor do I refer for that thing, but I think I can help you, and you stand there and you continue to engage. So it really is the leading of the Holy Spirit with these folks. And uh, but we have about about seven percent is kind of our target in terms of the initial uh, the initial uh, transformation. But with all the folks that call in that we engage, we send resources out to them uh, to help them uh, with the life decision, and then we also have an opportunity uh, to refer them. So it's it's really 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 difficult work uh, to do. But we you know it's interesting. Part of what caused us to start the uh, pregnancy decision line was actually a call. Uh, that came in through another uh, kind of initiative that we were connected in. And it was an initiative that was really focused on basically just referring people to pregnancy centers. And uh, my predecessor listened to the call. It was a young lady who uh, was just distraught, and she needed help now. And uh, the, the, the call center was only equipped to, like, just refer. They didn't have counseling and coaching skills. And, and uh, my predecessor listened to the transcript of that call. It was just heartbreaking. And that, came, and that was really what led us to say, we need to have an initiative that could meet a person like that at their point of need. And we just had some amazing stories, stories of women who have been in a Planned Parenthood, gone, had some issues, concern, maybe second guessing, going to the stall, uh, the, the ladies room stall, calling the pregnancy decision line, you know, being coached out of the Planned Parenthood onto the steps of the Planned Parenthood where they accepted Jesus Christ. Because all of our platforms have as one of the things that our goal is, is to give people an opportunity to become uh, disciples of Jesus Christ in terms of from an evangelistic uh, com we always present the gospel wherever uh, we have an opportunity to do that. It's a core piece because we know that's the key to transforming to transforming lives. So all the platforms, uh, service delivery platforms or Wells of Compassion do that. Uh, so we're always looking for an opportunity to do that. Now I imagine that the percentage of people that you get who come into the pregnancy center is a higher number than the number of people who just call in. Absolutely, it's much closer to nine. It's actually much closer to nine out of ten. It's hmm. pretty amazing hmm. when you have that personal contact. But you know, you can't hug somebody through a phone line, right? But but we still, our view was we still need to be able to reach those folks um, that because they're looking for immediate support, and in many cases they're looking for anonymity, and they may not make a decision in that call. To change, but we're giving them information, and we're engaging, and we're talking to them, and we're giving them a perspective uh, that they would not have had if they went to Planned Parenthood or some other piece. So, what we, in terms of what people tell us, that's what we know. But we know that uh, God's word does not return void, 
And so we're out there just delivering uh, delivering that 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 message to folks, a message that they would not have normally gotten if they had called, you know, some uh, abortion clinic that really, frankly, was looking for just a retail opportunity. Where we're talking about a transformational relationship. So it really is important to be able to get that person to the facility in order to have a face-to-face conversation about these decisions. Well, I I would I would probably answer that differently. I okay. would say it's really it's, it's really. It, it, I'm a business guy by training, <laughs> right? So the way I kind of think about this is that you've got the, the, the client here that has a certain set of needs, and then you have service delivery platforms that can deliver those needs. What's really important is that you get that person into a context where you're having a relational, where you're having a relational conversation with them, whether it's at a pregnancy center, whether it's at a church, whether it's at a Starbucks. <laughs> the, I mean, that's that that is really that that's the power of our movement that we haven't been locked in so if you lock yourself into a platform you know kind of mindset you actually hurt yourself one of the analogies i use often is um borders versus amazon and borders outsourced their online business to amazon because they wanted to focus on their core business which was bookstores because they thought people need bookstores in order to get books Amazon was focused on turning every home into a bookstore. They understood what it was. Well, we have the same dynamic here. Our secret sauce, which is the amazing aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is us, the believers. And we are mobile. (laughs) And the gates of hell cannot prevail. And that's the advantage that we actually have over the abortion industry. They need a a physical building in order to do what they do, even though they they can still do medical abortions with pills and stuff like that, and they're trying to do telemedicine. The vast majority of abortions probably will always be surgical. They need a facility. But we, (laughs) we are mobile. We are people. And whenever whenever somebody uh, makes a pregnancy decision for life, makes a pregnancy decision for life, it's not because uh, it's not because of physical structure, but it's because somebody came alongside them like Christ did and offered them compassion, hope, and help. So we're looking for as many ways as possible to be able to do that. Well, thank you, Rollin, for uh, helping us with this discussion. And we thank you for joining us on the table and hope you'll be back again with us soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.